Greetings, ladies and metal gents, and welcome to this latest rendition of Tales, Tales from Outer from Space. Outer space. Outer space. Taken from the subreddit HFY, all the relevant links will be down below. And as always, I hope that you enjoy, and if you do, please consider supporting the channel. Now, on to the science fiction. The Titans of Space, written by Timpanzi writes. The sterile chamber grated on Koal Bahari's senses. It was too white. The only splash of color was a small flag emblems of various shapes in front of each of the delegates. Koal stood on the center platform with two other advisors in the middle of the upside-down multi-tiered vanilla cake room. She towered over the others standing with her. At first glance, it seemed like they were arranged by height, when in fact they were arranged by importance. Despite being the tallest person present, Dr. Bahara would be the last person called upon to speak due to her position as a science advisor. When deciding whether her species would be allowed to join the Confederacy, military and anthropological considerations were given more weight than scientific consideration, in large part due to the applicant species' nearly always inferior scientific capabilities. Kaur Bahara had learned to stand perfectly still on the hard floors. Her large bulk made a lot of noise when she moved, and sound echoed around this room like a parasite that refused to die. She wasn't sure if it was coincidence, or if the politicians wanted it designed this way to give themselves more gravitas. Either way, Dr. Bahara thought it was stupid the most ostentatious room that she'd ever stepped foot in. This was a tenth time in the chamber, where all 198 species of the Confederacy were represented. Four stages up, over her left shoulder, she felt the eyes of her species' delegate boring into the back of her head. She had felt that it was necessary to inform him of the content of her report before she told the entire hall, as a professional courtesy. He had always been exceedingly concise around her before. Most politicians were when dealing with a scientist, but his tongue and schedule loosened significantly when she mentioned her recommendation. Unprecedented was the word that he kept using as if maybe, if he said it enough, she would realize the error of her ways. He proceeded to blather on about her career and the political ramifications amongst other things. He talked too much for her taste. They all did. When she finally managed to sneak a word in edgewise, she managed to shut him up by asking him specifically which part of her report did he disagree with. Was it that her conclusion was fallacious? He stammered and tried to dodge, but she pressed him into silence. Her findings were accurate, and her conclusion was correct. And in the end, that's all that mattered. Out of the blue, he apologized and reminded her to be careful. Like she didn't already know that. Kawar returned her attention to the chamber just as the military advisor, Exwit Lecax, was giving his recommendation. Full member, full responsibilities, no restrictions. The humans had militaries instead of a single military, which was quite unusual. But besides that, there was nothing outside of the ordinary. Their violent tendencies, their affinity for war, their military hardware, and their military's wartime performance were all within one sigma of norm. Pretty standard, and basically what you'd expect from a mammalian race. Exwit's report was succinct and complete. Kawal had been paired with Exwit for three other missions, and they got along surprisingly well given their differences. She stood a solid five feet taller than him, and they didn't even share a taxonomic class. Kowal looked like a bear-sized starfish with glasses and a lab coat, 
while Exwood looked more like a cross between a millipede and a dragon in an army uniform. However, they both got straight to the point and enjoyed the same type of humor. He glanced over towards her and gave her the barest hint of a nod and a knowing smile. No, she didn't mind working with Exwood. He might be a gunhead, but he's got a good sense about things and usually came to the right conclusions. Bob Dodpa, on the other hand, she greatly minded having to work with. This was his first assignment, and not only was he as green as hell, he was keener, a go-getter, and a narc, and a freaking brown noser. First, he tried sucking up to Exwit, which Kawal suspected had never gone well for anyone, ever. Since that failed so spectacularly, Bob turned his attention to Kawal. That lasted all of an hour before she explained to him, politely, that all three of them held equivalent ranks and were independent of each other's hierarchy. Exwit and her exchanged some sordid and somewhat humorous words later that evening. Bob droned on about his report with his nasally voice. She hadn't bothered listening to his report because she already knew the contents and the fact that he wasn't giving a recommendation. It must have slipped her mind to tell him that it was the dumbest idea because the whole reason that they were there as advisors was to give a recommendation. The end of his report came and went with no recommendation. A classic green move. She glanced over at Exford, who looked back at her and smiled. It seems that he may have also forgotten to mention the stupidity of not giving a recommendation. No, she didn't mind working with Exford at all. After Bob was thoroughly chastised for wasting the chamber's time, it was Kawal's turn. She took a deep breath, glanced over her shoulder at her representative to the Confederacy, then exhaled. She had to convince them. It couldn't be like when she told her own delegate. They had to listen. Scientifically, she started, the humans are within one sigma of where you'd expect them to be. They're certainly on the less advanced side of the bell curve, but she was cut off by the pandolin delegate. Well, if everything is in order and everyone is in agreement, I move that the humans be granted full membership, status, with full responsibilities and no restrictions. All in favor? And... Or at least what passed for hand sprouted up all around the hall. Kawal cursed herself. The delegates were obviously tired from a day of deliberation and annoyed after Bob's stupid report. She had to act now. They nearly had supermajority of hands. I recommend no wartime responsibilities and solo self-defense restrictions, she shouted, standing up straight. Every visual organ turned towards her. Hackle stood up on the back of a head appendage as the pandolin took a step forward. They were a proud people, and she had just dishonored him greatly. You are a science advisor, are you not? He spit the question like venom. Who are you to make military recommendations? My military recommendation is based off a new quirk of their scientific prowess that has never before been seen. She said, forcing herself not to slink away. It wasn't easy. The pandolin looked like her people's ancient predators. Rock eagles. Exwit LeCook's military report was a complete and accurate report on humans' current military capabilities. However, it is not their current capabilities that worry me. She paused for a moment, looking down. She needed this to stick. Gesturing broadly to the entire room, she said, What worries me, delegates, is what they might do next. Explain yourself, the pandolin delegate said. Perfect, she thought. His rage was now tempered with curiosity. Honorable delegate, she said, addressing him, How did your people invent nuclear weaponry? 
It was a weaponized reactor, he said, taken aback. As all species... All except humans, she interrupted. Humans invented nuclear weapons before they invented nuclear power. She had them on the hook now. It was time to reel them in. Also, computers, the basis of advanced civilizations. Did any species here invent computers solely for the purpose of war? Because humans did. Not only that... It was during the same six-year war that they invented nuclear weapons. Breathing orifices hung open around her. Two civilizational milestones taking place during the same six-year period was extremely unusual. But due to war, unheard of. It was time to sink the dagger. By the way... Did I also mention that they developed rocketry during this time period as well? The silence in the room grew. Three incredibly important civilizational milestones in a six-year period, all due to war. Never had a civilization developed nuclear power, computers, and space travel so quickly. Nor at least proto-space travel. But the point was still valid. Not that it mattered, because she wasn't done. They landed on their closest celestial neighbor a mere 66 years after discovering powered flight. They developed both slipstream and nullpunk FTL drives within eight months of each other, both because they needed the technology to wage war more effectively. The Confederacy hung on her every word. I feel that the following fact is the best representation of the terrifying speed at which humans progress during war. There are human math proofs that are illegal to know due to their military or security implications. Even we don't truly know how advanced their mathematics are, or, uh, more importantly, their cryptology so my recommendation is full membership, no wartime responsibilities, and solo self-defense restrictions. We need to minimize the amount of time that humans are at war. Currently, the creative and intellectual potential of humanity is dormant, and I'd like for it to stay that way. For everyone's safety. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video. I hope that you enjoyed, and if you do, please consider supporting the author, even by popping over and leaving a thumbs up or a nice comment, just to show your appreciation for the story. However, if you wish to support this channel, there are links down below which will help immensely. I will see you all in the next one, and until then, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Cheers.